So carrying on having a look at ANOVA, uh, we're now going to have a look at two-factor ANOVA, which is where we've got a blocking factor, which means that uh, we are then looking at a randomised block design. Uh, so this means that we think that there might be another factor that is affecting our outcomes and we want to control this to try and minimalise uh, the error that's made by that. Uh, we can still have a look at inherent random variation. Quite a lot of times you might be asked to look at and compare the means of these groups or uh, the difference from the means of these groups and make comments on that. Uh, we've got three similar assumptions similar to the one-factor ANOVA. So we've got that the three assumptions for two-factor analysis of variance uh, when there is only one observed measurement at each contribution level of the two-factor are as follows. So we've got that the population at each level of the combination is approximately normally distributed. Again, we've got that the normal population has a common variance and the effect of one factor is the same at all levels of the other factors. So again, we have some notation here and some formulas. And again, some of these are given to us in the formula booklet on page 7. Uh, I am going to just show how to do the graphical calculator method for this one. Uh, just to save a bit of time, as most of my pupils use the graphical calculator, but you can do it via an extension of the uh, non-graphical calculator method shown in the one-factor analysis of variance video. And uh, I'm also going to show a non-calculator version for uh, finding the Latin square design. So you can see that we just have an extended table here. Uh, and this time, we could be looking for a difference between the, whatever we've got in our rows. We could be looking for a difference between whatever we've got in our columns. And uh, this time, we're going to have an extra thing there, which is the residual as well as the total. Usually, we use I's for rows and J's for columns, but you're not going to get marked down too much for that in class. And we need to make this comment as well, where at least two are differing. So... Uh, here we have a computer manufacturer wishes to compare the speed of four of the film compilers. He measures the comp compilation time in milliseconds for each of the five programs run on four compilers. So we're testing at a 1% significance level that there's no difference between the programs of the four compilers. So we're looking at the compilers. This is our what we're testing. So for A, our H0 is going to be that mu i equals mu for all i equals 1, 2, 3, 4. Our H1 is going to be mu i is not equal to mu for sum i equals 1, 2, 3, 4, where at least two differ. So then we're going to put this into our graphical calculator. Now in the same way as we did with our one factor and over, we need to tell the graphical calculator where this piece of data is. So the first thing I'm going to put into list one is what compiler is being used each time. So I'm going to go down my list. So the 29.21 would be compiler 1, the 26.18 would be compiler 1, the 30.91 would be compiler 1, and so on. And then it would be compiler 2, then compiler 3, and then compiler 4. And what you'll notice about the two-factor ANOVA is because we need to have each compiler running each program, I've got five things on compiler one. That means that I have to have five things on the other three compilers as well. So in the second list, I'm going to say what program is running. So thinking about entering my data the same way as I was before. So 29.21 is program one. 26.18 is program two. 30.91 is program three and so on. Then I'd be going back to the top where I'm at the 28.25, which would be program one again then the 26.02, which would be the program 2 again, and so on. 
and we end up going through each of these so we've got one 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 two 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 three 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 four 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 five and then we've got one two three four five one two three four five one two three four five so in list three, I'm actually going to put my data in there. So like I said, I'm going to put it in the way that I've been thinking. So I'm going down. So I've got 29.21, 26.18, 30.91, 25.41, 29.14, 26.16, 28.25, 26.02, 30.18, 25. 0 0.26, 25.14, 28.20, 26.22, 30.52, 25.20, 25.20, 25.20, 25.20, 25.20, and 25.26. Then lastly, we've got 28.62, 25.53, 25.54, 25.55, 25.56. And then 25.46. And I would just quickly double check that I have entered all those numbers correctly because I have just entered a large amount of numbers into my calculator. And if I get one of these numbers incorrect, because I am just using the calculator to get my test statistic and to get my whole ANOVA table from, uh, that means that if I've made one mistake, then my values are going to be slightly off. And that means that I could end up losing a lot of marks. So for instance here, that should be 30.91. There we go. 26.18 and then 29.21. So then we're going to go to test ANOVA. And this time when it says how many, we're going to have two because we have two factors. We put the first factor, what compiler was being used into list one. We put the second factor, what program was being used into list two, and the dependent, the piece of data, we put into list three. So we need to change that to list three. Now, the main thing here is to be careful if you then go back to do a one factor ANOVA, because if I went back here now and clicked one, you can see that it's still reading that the dependent should be in list three. So just be careful of that. Always double check that your dependent is in the correct list. So here, this is correct. Compiler's in list one, the program's in list two, and the actual values are in list three. And then when I click Excel, it might take a second. You can tell it's working by this little swirling symbol. Some get a little square in the top corner when it's working. And there is our table. So this time we are going to have, because I put my columns in first, I put my compilers in first, that means that that first row of data is about my compilers. So we're going to have between the compilers. The second uh, column that I put in was my programs. So we're going to have between the programs. Then as I said before, we've got this extra thing here, which is going to be the error or residual. And then we have our total, which isn't on the calculator, but we are going to add in there. And as I said before about uh, good practice with this is to swap our first two columns. So we'll start off with the sum of the squares. So that'd be 1.063, 83.04, and 0.9354. I am going to come back and fill in this total later on. Then for the degrees of freedom, we've got 3, 4, 12, which gives me 19. The mean of the sum of the squares is going to be 0 0.3543, 20.76, 0 0.3544, 0 0.0779. And then finally, this time we end up with two F values, two test statistics, because I could be testing for either one of these. I could be testing for which compiler is best, or I could be testing for which program is best. Uh, another way that you can tell if you forget that it follows the way around that you put them into your calculator 
is that you can remember which uh, of our roles is for the compilers and which is for the programs because we've got five we've got four compilers and uh, four minus one gives us a degrees of freedom of three we've got five programs five minus one is four so we've got a degrees of freedom there of four so just adding putting this value in here that should be 85 oops point zero three eight four so here we were testing the compilers. It's a good idea to add in a line here where we've got mu i equals the population mean uh, compilation time for compiler i just in case it's not clear to the examiner what we are testing. It also helps when it comes to doing our conclusions. Uh, so here, we were looking at the compiler, so we're looking that this is our test statistic. Just rounding that to three significant figures. Now for the critical value, we're going to go across by the degrees of freedom between the compilers, and we're going to go down by the residual. So in this case here, we were using a 1% significance level. So this is back on page 21. Looking at the F distribution 0.99 table, we're going across 3 and down 12, which gives me 5.953. So then as the test statistic is smaller than the critical value, that means that we accept H0 at a 1% significance level there is insufficient evidence to suggest the mean compilation time of the four compilers is not the same where at least two differ. And then for part B, we're asked to comment on how the use of programming as a blocking factor proved worthwhile. Well, if we were doing the hypothesis test involving the programs instead of the compilers, then that means that our test statistic would have been 266. Our critical value would have been what well, we'd go across by 4 and down by 12, which would give us 5.412, which then means that as the test statistic would have been bigger than the critical value, we would have ended up rejecting H0 which means that at a 1% significance level, there is sufficient evidence to suggest the mean compilation time of the four pro of the five sorry programs is not the same where at least two differ. Which means that there was a difference between the programs and therefore, yes, the programs were a good blocking factor. Uh, 
Um, so that is what we need to do for two-factor analysis of variance. Do make sure that you add in this definition here of what it is that we are looking at, especially since we have two different things here. One factor and over, it is good practice to do it on there as well. But here it's more important because we've got two different things that we are looking at. Uh, so I'd like you to try the now you try question and thank you very much for listening.